All right, welcome back, everybody, and uh, on to our moral psychology panel with uh, three distinguished speakers. Uh, the first will be Dr. Missy Cummings, and she's professor in the Duke University Pratt School of Engineering and the Duke Institute of Brain Sciences, and is the director of the Humans and Autonomy Laboratory and Duke Robotics. Her research interests include human unmanned vehicle interaction, human autonomous systems collaboration, and the ethical and social impact of technology. She is a graduate of the US Naval Academy and was a fighter pilot, one of the first female fighter pilots, and received her PhD in systems engineering from the University of Virginia. And then Dr. Phil Root, he is the director of the Strategic Technology Office at DARPA. His previous positions at DARPA included program manager within their tactical technology office where he explored the intersection of AI autonomy and military operations. Before coming to DARPA, he was the director of the Center for Innovation and Engineering at West Point, and Dr. Root spent the first decade of his career as an Apache helicopter pilot in Germany and Korea. He is a graduate of the US Military Academy and received his doctorate from MIT. And then going third is Dr. Tony Pfaff. He is research professor for strategy, the military profession, and ethics at the Strategic Studies Institute at the US Army War College. He recently served as director for Iraq on the National Security Council staff. A retired Army colonel, he served in Operations Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom as philosophy professor at West Point, as the defense attache in Baghdad, and on the State Department's policy planning staff as senior Army and military advisor. He is the author of dozens of articles on ethics, leadership, and military strategy, and holds a philosophy PhD from Georgetown University. So welcome to you all. And Missy, uh, can, you, can you hear me OK? OK, yeah. thanks, thanks for joining. And uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for that um, wonderful introduction. It's always good to talk to my alma mater. And uh, it does seem like a long, long time ago that I was a midshipman there. And, uh, but I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to speak at this, um, in this venue. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, yay, it's all working. OK, so the thing I'm going to talk about today, as you heard, you know, I, I was in the military for a while. I flew A4 and F-18 Hornet. So I know what it's like to be on the tip of the spear. And then I got out, went back to school, got my PhD, and my PhD was, um, my dissertation was on some early work for evolving evolutionary technologies, and uh, I really got a foothold in basically the rise of unmanned aerial systems, more commonly known as drones. And then because of all of my research in drones, uh, when they started to become a more prevalent weapon system and they became hotly debated on the international scene. I kind of got pulled into the policy discussions. You know, I'm an engineer. Uh, I've always been an engineering professor, but now I find myself doing a lot of policy work and which ended up me testifying in front of the United Nations, basically on whether or not we should ban lethal autonomous weapons. And so I'm gonna come back to that idea in a second. So this talk that I'm giving you is a miniature of the talk that I gave to the United Nations. So the idea is, what should we be worried about? Should we be worried about meaningful human certification um, or meaningful human control? So as you heard, you know, that was me flying um, on carriers at one point in my life. My lab at Duke is called the Humans and Autonomy Laboratory. There's a joke in there. Only people over 40 or maybe even 50 um, can get the joke. So you have to ask somebody older what the joke is. All right. So the origins of meaningful human control. This is a phrase that you're going to hear quite a bit when uh, you start to hear people debate whether or not we should have artificial intelligence inside of weapons. So. This is from the Human Rights Watch, a group that I sometimes have friendly relationships with, and sometimes they're very angry with me because I push back a lot on a lot of what they're saying. They 
start out their thesis by saying, recognizing meaningful human control as a viable means to address problems posed by emerging weapons. Um, they in the Harvard Law School International Human Rights um, Group wants to ban weapons um, without any human in the loop. And so this is very tricky. So what does that really mean? What is meaningful human control? So I'll tell you that having been on the tip of the spear, being a fighter pilot, you know, it is questionable what meaningful actually means when you're dropping bombs. So as most of you are very familiar with, airplanes are very expensive. Uh, you know, we're just to launch a weapon, one platform, platform with weapons. Um, basically, the price tag is $100 million to start that. And it only goes up from there. So at $100 million a platform, uh, you know, it's expensive. And so because it's expensive, when we bomb, we like to bomb from high altitudes because we don't want to take any losses uh, because the aircraft are so expensive. This is unlike the A4, by the way, which I also flew it. We could lose those things at a million dollars a copy. Nobody cared whether we really lost those things. But, you know, we're in a different world now in 2022. And so when you're bombing from high altitude, it's not like you have a clear view of the target. You can't look out in your cockpit uh, glass and see what's on the ground. You have to rely heavily on sensors. There is both the proverbial and literal fog of war, depending on how much smoke is on the ground. It's very stressful. Uh, if you potentially could be fired at, if you're taking um, AAA anti-aircraft artillery from the ground, uh, you know, you want to stay clear of that. You want to stay clear of ground air missiles. So it's a very stressful environment. And it's not entirely clear that humans from what we would call and, and a human in a cockpit, Human Rights Watch would tell you is meaningful human control. But is it, you know, um, uh, then when we move that control to drones, uh, so this is a basically a Reaper ground control station, uh, the chair force, oh, I love making that joke because this is actually really literally uh, the exemplification of the chair force. Uh, I love those guys, despite the fact that I'm making fun of them. But, you know, now we have a couple of people, the pilot, the sensor operator, they're looking at all these screens and they are in control mostly, but there's some computer commanding going on in there. The computer can do some things like fly the aircraft, but in this concept of operations, we still have the uh, pilot, the human in the loop issuing um, fire commands. Okay, so we would agree that this is remote control, but it's still human is in control, but the computer is helping out a little bit. And then we go all the way up to um, command operations center. So this is an AOC, Air Operations Center, somewhere in the world. They look, oh, this is actually a, a NASA one, but the military ones look just like it. Lots of people, lots of screens trying to do coordinate between different entities, you know, different platforms, different parts of the military to, to try to make sure that everybody's on the same page for warfare. Now, is this meaningful control? What if one of these people issued a command to a Tomahawk missile, which by the way is technically achievable, right? So you, somebody from a remote center somewhere could, you know, if the submarine or ship is in the right location, they can hit the button and that button from a remote command center can actually send a Tomahawk, which is kind of like a wild dog in a meat locker. It's, I mean, it's gonna get there. It's gonna to go to that target where it's, where it's going to, to and, you know, it, with very high precision. So, but it's the computer smarts that make that happen. You know, we gave it a set of coordinates and then the missile makes it all happen. So is that meaningful human control? And you know, for the most part, the human is just the one um, who, who gave the command. And then we took look at this one. This is forward air control. So now we've got people on the ground who are doing something like lasing. They could put a laser on a target. And so they're holding a laser on the target. And then a human potentially could a human pilot like what I used to do. We can drop a bomb and that bomb will then if it's in the envelope will guide on the laser that the guy on the ground is holding. Well, guess what? A drone can do the same thing. And it's probably a lot safer for a drone to drop that 
to drop that bomb that is then basically effectively being controlled by the laser on that target. So is that meaningful human control? So I, I show you all this to say, it's really not exactly clear what the boundary of meaningful human control is and who the point of control is. Now, when we start talking about military AI and putting AI in weapons to guide on targets, you know, this is tricky. Um, automated target targeting uh, is has been the bane of military R&D for a very long time. That was way before artificial intelligence has was introduced into the scene. The Tomahawk missile can do a really good job um, when it does its uh, air to ground mapping. That's because it has some very, very precise maps inside of its uh, Tomahawk robot head. But Generally, computer vision, which is what forms the basis of most AI weapon systems when we talk about automated targeting, it's very, very deeply flawed. And this is where we have cameras who are trying to um, see what's in front of it and then decide what's going to happen. And so this is a picture of a Toyota uh, robotic car, driverless car. It, it's being driven by a human in this case and testing. And... This is this, you know, I'm actually working right now with the government on on the driverless cars to try to figure out how and if and where we should regulate these things. And so this problem I'm about to show you is endemic to all driverless cars, but also to all military weapon systems that rely on computer vision. So in this case, you see a truck. That's what you see, a truck crossing a road. But in this particular case, the Toyota driverless car stopped and it wouldn't go because it couldn't figure out what was in front of it. And that's because this is what the driverless car saw. Instead of saying, we'll go back a little side so you can see it. Instead of seeing a truck with some advertising on the side, the driverless car saw two trucks, a bus, a gigantic person, a fence, four poles, a traffic sign, right? And one more time so you can see, like, this is not at all what we, oops, uh, oh, well, well, there you go, let's go back. Um, this is what you see, this is what the system sees. That's bad. And this is actually why self-driving cars are having such a problem getting on the road. Uh, we don't have this problem solved. Computer vision systems work very bottom up, meaning um, they're at the pixel level, the reasoning that happens from computers, whereas humans, we reason top down. We know that once it, what is a truck and we can associate all different kinds of trucks, little trucks, big trucks, truck, truck, trucks with advertising, trucks with at night with lights. Uh, it turns out computer vision systems are incredibly brittle and they cannot make those abstract associations uh, like humans can. Indeed, um, just to show you how bad artificial intelligence is right now in terms of computer vision, this, these two pictures were taken from a very, very famous data. It's probably the most widely used data set in all of artificial intelligence. And the question is, can the, this uh, deep learning algorithm, which is used on many, many driverless cars and potentially in many, many military weapon systems, can it recognize the Granny Smith Apple? And with 85.6, 85.6%, I mean, that's not even that great. It can tell you that it's a Granny Smith Apple. But if you tape the word iPod to it, now it's with 99.7% accuracy, uh, it, can, it will label this as an iPod. I have to tell you, there are so many cybersecurity questions around this. Um, I actually think that uh, Department of Homeland Security really has their work cut out for them because the cybersecurity implications of AI um, and how brittle it is and how easy it is to fool AI, boy, we are in for a whole new um, world of hurt if we don't get that taken um, into account. So when we think about all this, I... I want you to think about what's, what's driving this. Should we, the pictures I just showed you, you would think, okay, there's no way we should have AI and weapon systems. No way. Well, I mean, you know, yes, I just showed you some really bad pictures, but there's a big caveat to that. So I would tell you uncertainty in the environment is the real difference between whether or not we should have AI and weapon systems. So this is a picture of the Chinese embassy um, that was bombed in Belgrade many, like 30 years ago. 
Uh, this was a mistake. This was a human mistake. A human pilot made this mistake. I doubt today if we were to, to repeat that battle and we were to use computer vision, I doubt we would have had this problem because computer vision, when you can train it on an exact building, the building I want to bomb, computer vision enabled systems are so much better than humans if we know the one specific target that we're trying to get and it never moves. So this is what I call in static targets, right? So there is this, for the most part, I'm not a big fan of putting artificial intelligence in weapon systems because for the most part, if there's fog of war, if the target is moving, if the environment is changing in any appreciable way, AI can really struggle. However, if we've got a clear sunny day and we've got some AI trained on this building, that building doesn't move and we've spent a lot of time verifying the algorithm, then the AI will always be better than a human pilot uh, because it can make these decisions much faster. It can make the decisions uh, that in terms of being able to see the geometry of buildings from far, far, much further away than humans can because it can leverage all these sensors. So understanding that there's maybe this one really narrow condition in today's world where AI can perform very well, but that's very, very small, narrow. I mean, that's probably only 5% of engagements that we would ever, 5 to 10% that we would ever really be able to, to leverage that understanding that most of war is dynamic and we probably shouldn't, you know, the question is, should there be a ban on autonomous weapons? And I also just want to point out that there's a difference between artificial and auto artificial intelligence and autonomy. You can have autonomy in a weapon system without having artificial intelligence. We do it all the time with the AMRAAM missile. We could argue that even heat seeking missiles are a form of autonomy, right? So you don't have to have any computer smarts in a system to make it autonomous. AI is a is falls under the umbrella of autonomy. It is not the overarching category. So given the fact that I've just told you that even by today's standards, there are very narrow conditions where AI can be used to effectively prosecute a target and really minimize da damage and civilian deaths. You know, it is my personal belief that we should not be doing bans on systems that do provide measurable benefit. The other thing is it's really hard to know, you know, the, the United Nations, there are a lot of people inside the United Nations that want to ban AI on weapon systems, but it's not clear what they're banning. Are they banning the perception system? Are they banning the use of computer vision? I think we've embarked in an entirely new world where software, uh, we're really talking about systems that are driven primarily by software. They're really not hardware driven anymore. And so they're hard to test and it's hard to know what what the failure modes are going to be. Indeed, the DOD, and this is my last point, really struggle in the test and certification of autonomous systems um, with embedded artificial intelligence. That's a huge new growth gap that I think the military faces. Also, the Department of Transportation faces this. So one of my points that I tried to make to United Nations and I'm making to you now is, look, we can't really even clearly define meaningful human control because that point of control, like I showed you, can move around um, depending on the different concept of operation. Where I think we should really start focusing our efforts are on meaningful human certification, meaning that the Department of Defense and industry Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, they need to work together to certify these systems as safe under specific operational conditions. So in this case, like, yes, AI can be used on clear sunny days with the building clearly in view. That's OK, but maybe it's not good to use an artificial enabled uh, artificial intelligence enabled weapon system on a truck moving in a crowded field of other vehicles. That's probably we're probably still years and years away from that. But we're not I'm not saying that that's forever. We are getting better every day. We're solving more problems. Um, the U.S. government has really leveraged a, an important relationship with a company called Palantir, which I think is doing really, really good work and trying to figure out how to operationalize artificial intelligence. So we're making progress. 
But if we're going to start going down this path of meaningful human certification, the big, big problem that I see, and, and I sat on the Defense Innovation Board for several years, uh, so I saw this firsthand, is we are just not training our workforce to be able to do it. I already told you the DOD struggles in this area, but, and this is one of the reasons that I like talking to crowds like this one at the Naval Academy, is because this is where it begins. We need to take it seriously that we have got to start training people in a whole new way of thinking. People who do test and certification of AI, they need to have a background in artificial intelligence and computer science and systems engineering and data science or statistics, whatever you really wanna call it. So we need to understand that safety, safety of AI is its own field and it's only gonna be growing and it has, it's a national, I would say it's a national crisis, not just in the Department of Defense, but also in the Department of Transportation and the Department of Homeland Security. We have got to start taking it seriously that we need AI, but we also need to make sure we have safe AI. And with that, I'll turn the field, uh, I'll turn over control. Thank you. Well, thank you, Missy, That's, that was great. Very good. <clears throat> <clears throat> And now from DARPA, Dr. Phil Root, thank you for joining us. Buttons, we're good. I think it's on. Great. And I had some slides. Should I run them here, or I can just hand, no, raise my hands? Them. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Technology is great. Yeah, the controller's over here, though. Okay. You want to use the podium? Sure. Yeah. I stand better than I sit. Just point this at the Real pleasure to be here. Real uh, challenge to follow uh, Dr. Cummings, but thank you for the invitation. So this is a place of leadership. Leadership requires trust, and trust requires vulnerability. So I'm going to talk to you about my conversion story and how an Army officer came to be a technologist and then talking to someone at the Naval, Naval Academy. Uh, so as, as uh, you heard, I started my career as an Army officer and uh, had the opportunity to go down range and run us on Afghanistan, I saw that uh, bad guys wanted to look like civilians and made our job very difficult, our job in discriminating uh, friend from foe, say. And so I wanted to do something about it, and I had the opportunity to interview and work at DARPA. So the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, uh, is uh, chartered to do high-risk work the best way to prevent surprise is to create surprise, and so creating surprise requires risks, but sometimes they pay off, hence the reason that we need a place like DARPA. But high-risk work requires us to break paradigms. So we're about breaking through, I'm sorry, breaking with paradigms, not breaking through to uh, encourage the existing paradigm. And so I wanted to bring out a program that would break with our current paradigm. And our current paradigm at the time in Afghanistan was significant overhead ISR, looking for uh, sur surveillance and reconnaissance, intel surveillance and reconnaissance, looking for bad guys. And of course, that's very hard to do when the bad guys don't want to die, because then, as I said, they try to look like civilians. And so our job was very complicated, and I viewed it as my role to help the soldiers and Marines walking the streets never to be surprised. And so I had an approach that was a technical approach that I'll, we'll talk about, uh, and what I hope to get to at the end is how I converted from a technology pure uh, perspective to one that is very much aligned with what uh, Dr. Cummings mentioned about not just meaningful human control, but rather thinking about the larger system and make, bringing out the best of our human decision makers, which I argue is virtue and not well captured by the, what we typically refer to as ethics. And so if I can get to that point, I think I've done my job. There we go. Uh, and so I started a program called the Urban Reconnaissance Through Supervised Autonomy, URSA. A little uh, background. I pr my first proposal was URSA Major, and this had kinetic effects at the end. And that got shot down, pun intended. And so I proposed URSA Minor, which was everything short of lethality. So I went in big with changing the perspective. And I'm really glad that we scoped it down. It was not prudent to consider kinetic effects. But Ursa Minor still tried to solve the problem that I motivated. And you see that on the picture on the left, 
What I wanted to do was to find bad people in urban spaces. This is a crucible of modern warfare, and I wanted to help those that were in harm's way, uh, soldiers and Marines. And what I want, the way I wanted to do so was different. ISR is passive. But what I found when I was downrange is that the bad guys knew they were being observed, and so they not only camouflaged themselves, but they tried to deceive. And so I thought, what is a different way for them to uh, demonstrate their intent? What's in their head? And what I proposed, you see in the picture on the left, was a series of probes, elicitations. If you're an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, you might recognize this as system ID. I have some unknown black box I put some energy in. I don't know what's in the black box, but what I get out tells me something about the black box. So I was trying to treat the system like a, a black box, and I said, for example, if I'm looking at a crowd and I dropped a flashbang grenade, those that had military training would react differently than those that did not. And that would be some information. And if I did a variety of different probes, you could see the curves move to a point where I have a, a high true positive rate and a low false positive rate, and this would be good. This would allow us to say something about the people that we filter out. And as we started this, I was getting excited about the technical opportunities to move the paradigm in this direction. And we thought, this could be scary, so we better have uh, a legal, moral, ethical panel kind of at the end to clean it up and make sure that it looks presentable. I'll get to that in a second, but I want to show you is what this system could look like in the hands of the Chinese applied to COVID. So what you'll see, oh, thank you. If you could play that video, I'll let you do it. So this is a video of woman in Inner Mongolia being told to go home and being followed home and followed home. And the longer version of that, thank you, the longer version of that gets a little creepy where she's looking over her shoulder like, I got the hint, and the drone has nowhere else to go, and so it just keeps following this woman. And imagine if we were dropping more probes behind her this is not in the best practice of the US and our allies. Next slide, please. And so what we did is instead of having your typical legal, moral, ethical panel at the end to clean it up, right, to make it presentable, we put them in what control systems engineers would call feed forward. And so that white box is what I call the warfighter virtue working group because legal, moral, ethical is not enough. What we did is took inputs into this group, and this group is composed of technologists, military professors, ethicists. I like to say we brought philosophers, locked them in a room, and said you can't go until you have some input into the technologists. And so they had some outputs that you see depicted here, but then the performers, and that's a DARPA term for people, the contractors, the one doing the work, the technical work, the performers would take that as an input rather than us being removed, we created this virtue working group to try to anticipate the problems and help the performers before they ran into them. So I'll give you some examples. You can imagine international humanitarian law says that we need to have proportionality, we need to have uh, necessity. Uh, we need, and those are uh, based on some concepts, for example, the concept of harm. Well, an algorithmicist, dare I say an AI engineer, right, they just want the algorithm. Just give me a number, how much harm? And if it's too much harm, then I'll dial back. But they, it, right, AI is just math, so they just want to know how much harm am I creating. Well, that doesn't exist in philosophy. We don't typically, because typically humans can appreciate what we mean by harm. Computers don't care, part of the problem. And so uh, it was the experience, I'd argue, of my lifetime working with this group for a number of reasons, and some are here, uh, General Retired Barnes, uh, Jesse Kirkpatrick, uh, Mitt Reagan, uh, who I recommend you read his article, One Minute in Haditha. It really changed my perspective on military ethics. Uh, through this group, we informed the Defense Innovation Board and hence the, uh, the Jake and now the DOD's AI ethics in a, tangentially because we were able to ground the discussion in what AI ethics means based on technology. We were able to see what technology could do see actual technology at work and some of the challenges and feed that back. I'm done with the slides, please. 
And so then, this is my conversion story. My conversion story is I realized technology is not enough. Technology is not enough because uh, when we started experimenting with this, what we realized is uh, the human needs to not only be in control, the, need, the human needs to exert command. And command and control, we typically lump, lump together. In fact, we just call it C2, and it means one thing to us. And I argue they're not. And so I'm going to say the same thing that Dr. Cummings said from a different perspective. Control, I'd argue, is about dictating where units or uh, capabilities move or create effects. And so we can control certain assets. And so we have an argument, as Dr. Cummings said, about meaningful human control. But what we intend and what we desire is command. And command is the, uh, related to commander's intent. And it's the purpose behind the actions that we take. And as I mentioned, and I tried to motivate when uh, I talked about harm, computers have no connotation of intent. As, again, as Dr. Cummings said, this is, these are statistical-based systems, at least currently. And so we're talking about correlation, not causality. And the difference is vast. And that, that vastness creates a number of uh, challenges because we use the term AI as if and then we uh, anthropomorphize it in a way that's not helpful. And so what we want is command and related to autonomy of what we're left with are, are correlative numerical math approaches, and we can't impress our, our ethics upon that. And so I argue that when we look at uh, JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control, that's a dangerous concept because we're saying, I want to command and control from a distance. And so even the concept of manned command and control from a distance, all knowing uh, is challenging within the uh, structures of what Clausewitz would call the fog of war. How do we possibly try to recreate that for technology? And so uh, what we did in the program, back to the program, is we forked the effort. And only at DARPA we could do this because we knew when we forked it, one is going to fail. You, so that the baseline effort kept pushing the technology. But the option path, the backup path, said, let's start over. Let's start over and make the human as good as possible. And so we started all the way over, and we reused some of the code, but we started over and said, let's make the human the center, not the machine. So we had to design all the requirements differently. But they, they caught up, and we had a joint demonstration. What we saw was fascinating, because what we saw is that the system designed around the human performed better, not just was more ethical, in some sense of the word, but help the human make better decisions. Because we thought about the human's decision rather than just how do we make the best AI decision. And so it was help the human make better decisions, higher probability of detection, lower probability of false alarm. They could make those decisions faster uh, in a way that validated what we really want, I'd argue, is virtue. And virtue is different than I'd argue than ethics, and many of you would, uh, this could be a very long conversation. But when we say ethics, the way I, I have tended to use it, we mean minimum standards. And the way I, I validate that is because it's imposed by lawyers. And lawyers don't care about getting the best. They care about, have you broken any red line? Right? So this is my, if you will, a linear programming set. And if you're along the constraints, those of you that are, are uh, algorithmicists or uh, linear program experts, these are minimum. I have to satisfy the constraints. And what's ethical is along some constraint. It's inside the boundary. But what's virtuous is at the top. And we don't have a structure to create virtue and try to uh, arrive at the most virtuous solution. Rather, if we think about military ethics imposed by or delivered by AI, we'll have something that's icky. We'll have something that's just barely inside the line. And that's not what we intend. That's not what America is about, if I can. Uh, it's not what our, our warrior ethos demand. And so what we want are virtue-based development practices. And so we've coined the term DevFOps. So DevOps is short for developmental operations. That's where you build a little and then test some with the operator. And based on that, you get feedback and you build a little more. DevSecOps does that with security in mind rather than bolting on security at the end. And we saw a parallel and analog with DevFOps. Let's build the ethics. Yes, I'm using ethics because it's calling it virtue. DevVerOps is a mouthful. But DevFOps says, you better put the ethicist in the feedback loop with the developer so that we build 
with the developer, and, I'm sorry, with the operator and uh, her, or his uh, ethics, virtue-based warrior ethos in mind. And so I've been converted. My conversion story is I look at all command and control differently as a result of this. There are many things that technology can do. As Dr. Cummings said, it's not clear that we should do all those things. And so coming from a place like DARPA, you might expect me to say technology can do it all. I'm here to say technology can absolutely do a great deal to help humans, warfighters, make the best decisions possible. So with that, thanks very much. All right, how are we doing? That slides up. There we go. All right, well, uh, yeah, Ed, thanks for uh, inviting me to this, uh, uh, to this event. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and get right into it for the sake of time. Um, so I was asked to uh, work with Project Ridgeway uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, and Project Ridgeway is an effort by the 18th Airborne Corps, along with some others, uh, to actually use, uh, use currently available technology to uh, be essentially AI ready uh, to today. Uh, and a lot of that effort involves integrating AI and data technologies into their lethal targeting process. Now, when I first got involved, uh, the commander, the then commander, General Carrilla, basically asked me, wanted to know, gave us our question, which was, how do I trust this system? Uh, and it's a system. It's not just the AI technology, it's how it interacts with the sensors and how it interacts with uh, the uh, targeting, the, the, the assets that are going to go target uh, 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 and execute the targets down the line. Uh, and that question uh, for him broke down into two parts. One was, how can I be accountable, and we've talked about that, uh, for the output of the system. And even if I can, uh, I, can, I can get to a standard where I can trust and understand the system, how do I trust that the humans that are helping me operate the system are going to do it well and not succumb to things like uh, uh, um, automation bias and other cognitive issues? Uh, so, um, we just, uh, we took, oh, wait, uh, so we took a look at that. Uh, now first, um, answering questions like how do I trust AI requires first understanding the context in, um, in which it is applied. Second, it requires understanding what it is we're trusting it to do. And then finally, having a good idea of how to interact with the system, which includes how that system receives input, provides output, in order to ensure that trust is warranted. Now, generally speaking, hmm? oh, clever. Uh, uh, um, uh, so <coughs> generally speaking, uh, what, uh, we, when we see the idea, even just targeting in general, but in the employment of AI in the targeting process, we kind of conceive it as a trade-off between uh, maximizing the machine speed, but at the same time, as we've been talking about, not just at this panel, but, uh, but previous as well, is ensuring, ensuring you know, that there's proper human oversight. Now, for context, uh, our, this system uh, is a four-step process which uh, comprises of decide, detect, deliver, and assess phases. And as currently employed, AI primarily applies in the uh, employed in the 18th Airborne Corps process, applies in the detect phase where sensors provide input, generally imagery, to an algorithm which relies on curated data to predict whether and where objects are. And in the future, AI might impact other areas, parts of the cycle, which include asset allocation, as well as assessment of battle damage and effects. Now, this process is both iterative and interactive. It is iterative in that the system can learn during each cycle and even within each cycle, uh, which hopefully uh, improves its performance. It is also interactive uh, as generally there is an adversary on the other side engaged in the same cycle. To the extent the adversary is similarly equipped, the one who gets through the cycle faster generally wins. Since machines are faster than human, this puts pressure on humans to rely more and more on the machine, even if it means taking extra risks because speed matters. But risk to whom? Oops, sorry. So risk to whom? Um, uh, and this brings us to a conversation about what it is we're trusting an AI-driven system to do. So generally speaking, from both a practical and ethical perspective, lethal targeting requires one balance of the demands of defeating an enemy, avoiding non-combatant uh, uh, casualties, and protecting the force. These are essentially questions of risk. 
Put simply, lethal operations expose both friendly combatants and non-combatants to risk. Avoiding non-combatant casualties exposes friendly combatants or the operation to risk. And protecting the force exposes the operation or non-combatants to risk. In a human-only process, trusting that we can balance this correctly depends on the capabilities of one's soldiers, the we one's soldiers, the weapons they carry, and ensuring that they understand and will comply to the law of armed, con uh, the law of armed con conflict and other applicable norms, as well as be able to hold them accountable when they don't. Now, with AI, there's additional barriers. Um, and we've talked about some of these, but I'll just go over them briefly. Um, uh, that, that impact trust, and our, uh, so first we'll talk about the data, the algorithm, and, and external interference. Algorithms are often only as good as the data that they are, they are trained on. And it is this training where the machine learns to differentiate items of interest from everything else. Relative to data, collecting data sets that are accurate, complete, and consistent, and timely for the system to train on is extremely difficult and very sensitive to context. Uh, keeping them updated is critical, and it has to be ongoing. The challenge is that is extremely to do that and to collect all the necessary data to make the system nearly perfect. As a result, the system will uh, make mistakes when the inputs do not closely resemble the data in which the system was trained. Regarding performance issues, these usually take the form of misclassifications, false positives, and false negatives. I've got some examples on the slide. But when the inputs to AI classifiers do not resemble the training data, the prediction, uh, then prediction mistakes are more likely. This happens, for instance, when a classifier was trained only using images taken during a certain season, like summer months, of openly exposed targets, and then presenting it with images of partially concealed targets taken during another season, like the winter. If a classifier was trained using only images of tanks, for example, operating in the desert, and then asked to classify the image of the tank partially covered in snow, it's a good chance it'll make a mistake. To try and counter such mistakes, it's going to be important to continuously search for and collect new informative data examples as they become available, and then use them to retain and update the classifier as needed, especially relative to the environment one is operating in. Um, oftentimes, this means collecting on the fly, uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, while the systems, while you are conducting active operations. The main point here is that classifiers can make mistakes given the state of the art and the difficulty of collecting these comprehensive data sets. Also, while AI can, AI can be something of a black box because how it arrives at output is not always discernible to humans, either due to the complexity of the algorithm or that the output depended on something, uh, something like the strength of the connections in the neural network. So it's important for commanders and operators to understand the limitations of AI and get a sense of the system's performance in similar conditions, thereby enabling them to make wiser decisions regarding how much control they wish to provide uh, based on their assessed risk calculations for a given mission. And also, as we talked about, we've talked about this earlier, other sources of concern are always who the enemy, who can poison a data set beforehand uh, or uh, spoof it during an operation. Uh, but this is where the accountability gap uh, 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 arises. So even if I can explain a system, I still may not have a full understanding or comprehension of how it arrives at that output. Uh, and this inscrutability can give rise to automation bias, especially when a system is normally uh, Reliable, but what's I think important to note here is uh, that AI performance, when conceived this way, is not all about speed. In fact, the machine provides, as we just heard from Phil, much better output when humans interact with it, uh, even during operations. So that the so the idea that developing and employing AI involves a trade-off between speed, for example, and meaningful human control, is something of a false dilemma. The question then is, how do humans know when and where? to interact to provide that control, to optimize that performance. All right, so to get there, there's a couple of things we can take into account. Trust and risk, of course, are our central concerns here. Commanders need a reliable way to know when AI can be trusted um, and when it should be allowed to execute some stages of the targeting process with less supervision for the benefit of speed, but at the cost of more risk. Neural networks uh, that the machine relies on basically it would provide a measure of confidence in the course of their operations that in a probabilistic sense regarding how confident they are regarding uh, with each target classification. This information can then be exploited during targeting to make informed decisions about the level of human supervision required, especially when combined with other information, such as the commander's tolerance for risk, and that's our other source of input. Um, uh, determining the level of acceptable risk for the AI to operate is the commander's decision. 
Therefore, the commander should be given the flexibility and option to assume more risk at times if based on, uh, on their best judgment and the conditions merit it. For example, a commander may be more risk averse in a counterinsurgency environment or in an uh, urban environment where the chances of uh, civilian casualties are higher and less risk averse in an environment where, uh, th where the chances of those casualties are lower or the importance of the mission is higher, like your, your, uh, your, your, your position's about to be overrun. Uh, so you have to fire, you know, final fi uh, uh, protective fires to save your position. Now, to capture risk toler tolerance, we can give commanders a rheostat-like uh, uh, knob uh, that can be tuned to convey risk tolerance directly to the system. And this slide is basically tries to, it shows those two inputs, how they come together. This is where fuzzy logic can help. And the concept here in fuzzy logic is not to hard code single value thresholds as indicated by the figure on the right, on the left rather, which specifies where certain values belong to certain categories. For example, 34 is moderate, 32 is low. Rather, the idea is to program transitions between the input classes of low, moderate, and high, as indicated by the gradual change in color in the figure on the right. This makes fuzzy logic more tolerant of uncertainty when measuring and quantifying inputs into these linguistic sets. The regions where the moderate set overlaps with either low or high or the ranges where input would be classified as belonging to multiple sets with partial membership in each. For example, a value could be 80% high or 20% moderate. Now, how do we apply that here? This slide shows what it might look like for a targeting process. Logically, because we have three inputs on both, uh, uh, we, have, we have three values on both inputs, uh, we have a, uh, a rule base of nine that can recommend settings for human oversight. The rule base would be programmed into the controller's memory using a series of if-then statements, which would follow the logic of something like, if AI confidence is low and commander risk tolerance is low, then human involvement is maximum. If AI confidence is high and commander risk tolerance is high, then human involvement uh, could be minimum. Um, uh, and what does that look like? So what the, that translates to, uh, different settings, uh, different ways humans are going to interact depending on what, the rule, what, what rule gets activated. The controller's decision for maximum involvement would generally apply a human-driven targeting process where humans lead each stage. But as the slide suggests, it doesn't preclude AI from assisting those steps. In other words, AI can augment any step, but a human must explicitly verify the output before the target, before the target process proceeds. On the opposite extreme, minimum involvement translates into AI automating almost all the steps, except for perhaps the final validation authorization process, because that's important to the overall retraining uh, and optimization of the system. Um, <clears throat> the moderate oversight process is gonna be a little more nuanced, and it's similar to minimum oversight, except that the classification confidence of the, of the algorithm and the risk assessment from integration must meet very stringent thresholds, and if they're not met, then the machine is gonna notify a human to get involved. So, to wrap up, how this, this addresses the responsibility gap, at least in part, because now we identify what the commander is responsible for, for the risk assessment and for ensuring that the, the system itself is properly trained and operated. It addresses automation bias because now the machine can at least in some points of the operation point out where it's not sure uh, uh, that its output, uh, it, 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 its output is, is, is accurate. Uh, so this identifies times and humans then will be, mo uh, you know, should, uh, intervene, uh, and, uh, and then the question is, okay, is this good enough? Because even with these, this may be progress, but it's obviously not going to be perfection. And I think there, uh, we, we are left with the question to answer, is it good, does it perform better relative to balancing the three imperatives I showed up, I showed earlier? If that does better than uh, a human-only process, then I think we've at least moved the ball down the field a little bit, and the more we get used to these systems, and the more that we apply them, and the better and the and the and the and the better able we are to align better data sets, better sensors, uh, and better human understanding of how the system works, we've at least uh, moved the ball down the road. And on that triple note, I'm done. Conclusion slide. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, so we have um, a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, who wants to go first? Okay, uh, Mike Skirker. Uh, 
and the microphones are coming down. This is for Dr. Root. Thank you for your presentation. Could you say more about how you could make the man better and build the AI system around the human? Could you talk more about that? Yeah. So, for example, in the Ursa system, we looked at the decisions that the human is going to need to make. And those decisions could be fed with a system that, uh, similar to the one Tony presented, but we looked at what would help a human? What would help a human make a decision, for example, about targeting at the extreme? At that point, we want to, what we realize is uh, you want to understand information about uh, how long a potential target might have been tracked and what is the certainty in simplicity? What is the certainty with which the system has about the uh, custody of those tracks? So if something so goes inside and comes back outside, machines struggle for all the reasons that uh, Missy highlighted, for example. And so we wanted to highlight to the human <coughs> what are the times where the machine has uncertainty. It goes to a point that, that Tony brought. And so uh, this is a, what we learned is there's a development strategy to try to understand what exactly the human needs to know. And that was, I just gave you just a flavor of what that could look like. But you needed to be involved in a DevOps way because if you ask a, an operator, they'd say, well, I need to know this. Then you give them that and they realize, oh, that's actually not complete. I need a little bit more or nuanced. And so it really needed to be an involved development strategy to try to understand what they needed and in the process make the best decisions and those best decisions we often call ethical. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Jesse, you had a question? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the panel for a really interesting and engaging talk. Um, my question is for Phil and if, if um, and Missy if she has thoughts on this and if it might fit with her concept of meaningful human certification. So we've heard over the course of these two days a lot about uh, testing, evaluation, validation. Um, and I'm wondering if you could share your thoughts on, um, on how, that might, how that process might work um, either in the context of, uh, for ethics, Right yeah. or or virtue, and as you know, as you've described, um, you know it, it feels, and this might be sort of a crude characterization, but it's often, and, I, and this isn't about dark or the program, but often you know there's there's uh, tech companies talk about ethics, but they don't have uh, you know kind of identifiable and clear articulation of what testing and evaluation, uh, you know, when it gets right. We know when it goes wrong. Um, but not necessarily when it's right. So I guess, yeah, thinking about uh, how we might test and, and evaluate and potentially validate uh, sort of embedded ethics within these, within kind of tech development and AI in particular. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Jesse. Uh, I'm gonna be brief, because I'd love to hear if Missy has uh, broader thoughts, because uh, I, I think she's actually one of the world's leaders in this thinking. Uh, I've been approached by industry to say what we need to build is an ethical proving ground. So you're familiar with the military, you build, uh, some company builds a tank, then we have a proving ground. Uh, we, we submit it to cold, we submit it to hot, vibration, and we can certify in all the ways we expect it to be used and walk away saying, yeah, it seems to work well. Uh, the reason I reject the idea of an ethical proving ground within that framework is that the challenge of the domain we're in, AI ethics, uh, or more broadly, the ethics of autonomy, is that we need to be comfortable with the unknown. And the idea of a proving ground is we can expose it to everything. And the problem is, of course you can't, because nobody would have thought in the ethical proving ground of taping the word iPad to a Granny Smith and seeing how the, the system breaks completely. I'll give you one of my favorite tech war stories. Uh, I had a separate program, and our job was to try to identify uh, uh, military targets. And so we were working uh, with Marines for a week, and they were great sports. The system wasn't working well, and so they just literally walked back and forth. This wasn't even close to military-like operations. They just walked back and forth. And at the end of the week, I said, now the tables have turned. The software is as good as it's going to be. Why don't you guys see if you can prove that you can get 800 meters from the line of departure, and if you can come and touch the camera without it detecting you once, you win. 800 meters, now here's a frame rate of like 60 frames per second. Very hard to beat, because even at 85%, some frame, it will detect the Marine. 
and then slew a, a, a weapon system in your toast. All the Marines in the squad came up and touched the camera. Why? I love Marines. Two hid under a cardboard box and shuffled the whole way up. One hid behind a corrugated tin. Two somersaulted the whole way, laughing the whole way. I think I got nauseous. 800 meters is a long way to... to. One guy, my favorite, stripped a pine tree and walked, walked, just walked, straight toward the camera. All you could see was this big smile. And the machine never saw a Marine. And so the idea of an ethical proving ground where we can expose it to all of the unknown and somehow prove it is empty. So I, I think a certification where it can certify that the operators, uh, to Tony's point uh, and to Missy's point, that the operators understand the bounds of which this system is helpful and don't stray without that has to be part of the certification because the operators have to uh, be, we ensure that we're training them where this system seems to be reliable and where it doesn't. Missy, do you mind if I turn it over to you? Sure, um, yeah, I mean, I think all those examples are true for a real world version of that. So everyone probably can appreciate that there's significant face recognition being in, used in China and not in um, always with the best intentions. And so on university campuses, right? So I, I hear a lot about this. And my students, when they go home to China, they've learned how to print out faces, other people's faces that, that are the same size as their face. And they'll just hold up this picture whenever they're going through, they know they're going through a face recognition system. So um, they've learned how to defeat one particular system uh, very quickly. Uh, and so it just goes to show you that this, this idea of how brittle AI is yeah, I mean, this is a problem. And, and why I, while I think, I don't mean to be paternalistic in what I'm about to say, because um, it sounds a little condescending, but look, we can't even figure out how to make sure AI can do the job it's supposed to do. You know, is that an enemy? Is that not an enemy? It, you know, is that a child or is that just a short person? Um, we're, we're really struggling with basic performance of these algorithms. And while I, it's a nice thought exercise that we could have an ethical proving ground, but before we make that leap, I'd just like to have just a performance proving ground. I'd like the military to get a voice recognition system that works. It doesn't have any that, that I think that passes the Missy Cummings sniff test, much less a computer vision test. Um, I have yet to see um, a really eye-watering performance of any vehicle on the road under any conditions. And so, yeah, I'd like to, to explore that idea, but first I think we need to concentrate on the basics. Hmm. That's sobering, okay. But there was one question in the back, yeah. That'll be the last one for this session. So understanding that learning for AI is going to be our data sets, um, and also understanding that as human neural networks, our brain learns through experience um, and our data set of experience. Um, are we looking at meaningful ways to identify uh, historic contextual based data sets. Yeah. Uh, for example, all the ISR video feeds that we've gathered over the last 10 years as training data sets um, for our ML. Yeah. Uh, this is something that is huge. If we can't find and create meaningful data sets, we're never going to advance our systems. Do you mind if I start? Um, so I'm going to expand your question some, because I think uh, one way to view the, the challenges that we, we've all presented is that the current state of AI is statistical, is probabilistic, it's uh, highly correlative, and in the field of ethics, it is not. Uh, and the difference is causality. We understand cause and effect, and probabilistics have, have no connotation of that. And so uh, at DARPA, we have a language, or we refer to AI going through uh, we're in the middle, we're beginning, the third wave. The first wave was rule-based, think uh, tax software. 
that I understand all the rules no matter how many. The next wave, and it's been phenomenal in some cases, is statistical based. And that's where the more data, the better. And we can try to make some prediction of the future based on what I've seen. The challenge is, is that all that you get, as uh, Missy demonstrated, is, uh, is statistical, is probabilistic. And that benefits when it's part of a larger system. But it's hard for the system to make any judgment as to uh, the impact of its future action if it has no uh, sense of causation. And so, so some of the advanced autoencoders, if you're familiar with the GPT-3 uh, language model, for example, does a phenomenal job of, of spitting out words that sound like they're sense, but they have no meaning. They just seem, they're like a, an interpolation of what it's seen before. But we want our words that have meaning. And so, uh, for example, the GPT-3 has been used to try to create an automatic um, suicide prevention hotline. Failed miserably, because it could never be told that was your intent. So people would say, should I hurt myself? And they'd say, well, we hope you have a good day. Like, it's not helpful. And so you can expand that to, to this field. And so what we don't need is, I, I fundamentally believe we need a new field of mathematics uh, to, to uh, address the uh, a lack of our ability to uh, make causal predictions counterfactual. And only then can we have another discussion about uh, the ramifications of autonomy. Until then, we really have to uh, live within the ramifications of uh, the systems that we have. Yeah, um, say something. Uh, I think you turned it off. The, yeah, so uh, uh, I think, I, I know at least from the uh, experience that, uh, of, of the Ridgeway guys, uh, who are actually out now, who are out deployed right now, doing some of this you know, in real time, uh, it's, it's, that's not, I, I, with confidence that they're, they're integrating to the extent they can anything that's, you know, legacy. Uh, but they've got a couple, there's a couple of bottlenecks. And one of the bottlenecks is, of course, getting those data sets built. That's a human intensive process and a, in a big part of what we mean by, if we're going to really talk about meaningful human control, humans are all over this process, uh, over, all, over all aspects of this process. And so humans are making a lot of decisions that are going to affect machine performance when they decide what's the ontology, what are we going to classify these things at, how are we going to label them. We don't have a lot of data labelers. China's got, what, two million, something like that? I can't tell you the number, because I'm not allowed to, but it's not nearly that many, at least not dedicated to DOD projects. Uh, uh, so that's a bottleneck for us, because, this, because the performance is very sensitive to environment. So uh, what I need right now, uh, if I'm going to operate, oh, let's say somewhere in Europe, I need kind of current data about this, not just about that terrain as it is, but also seasonally. Uh, so that I can make, uh, uh, and then with the images of the things that I want to detect. So that limits the number of things I can put on my target list, because I, you know, I can't have a big target list. Uh, I can only have a little one. Uh, and, then, and then it's going to take me a while to do that. So that's kind of the challenge right now, is building those sets and then making them robust enough that they are uh, sensitive to, are, are able to perform in, in, in the environment in which they're going to operate. Thanks, Tony. And Dr. Cummings, did you want to have the last word on this? I think, I think those were all great answers. I, I do think that I just would really encourage everybody that this data labeling issue too, um, uh, not only do we not have enough data labelers, we're not, a lot of applications of AI don't actually use humans to label data right. because it's such sure. a time right. intensive and costly process. Now a lot of companies are using automated machine labeling. And so it's actually, we have a big research project going on in my lab right now to assess, um, you know, at any given time, it's widely accepted that there are eight to 10% errors in labeled data sets, human and machine. Yeah. And we really have no idea what, how those errors propagate into performance later. So uh, stand by. We're looking at that. And ask me to come back next year, and I'll tell you all about it. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us virtually, too. And, and thanks to Phil and Tony also. This is a great panel. And uh, give them another round of applause.